So, shalom. Shalom. I'm very glad to meet you. Because, uh, well, we meet at the Chadar Ochel or on the, on the road or near the house. But uh, it's uh, different if we see everybody. And um, I also want to say perhaps that I, am, I appreciate very much your part in our community. Because you are part of the community. And that's why I want to uh, show you today some pictures of how Madan Michael started. Because Madan, you know Madan Michael like it is today. <coughs> Green, big, many people, many children, everything. Many help. And it was not always like this. So that's why I want to tell you how Madan Michael, oh, I think I can say, evolved. <laughs> And what is in Madame Michael, which maybe you, uh, you, you don't, uh, don't meet everything. Because uh, everybody, you know, everybody has his compound, and everybody has his uh, times of uh, whatever he does. And uh, there are things that perhaps um, you don't see them because they're not always, uh, we, uh, we, we don't see them all. And the first thing is, you have to, uh, you have to uh, excuse my English, which is of course uh, perhaps better than your Ivrit, but <laughs> still it is not, it is not my language. I, uh, I just uh, learned here as a as a student, I learned the English, and my English is so-so, but I, I hope that we will understand each other, right? So let us begin. Let us begin the first one. Ah. Uh, when you look from the Makel, no, uh, when you look from the mountain, from the Carmel mountain, these are more or less the area of Madame Michael. You see, uh, you see uh, pastures, you see fields, you see dunes, you see fish ponds, and you see the Mediterranean, right? A long time ago, uh, nearly a hundred years ago, this area looked different. That's how it looked. The same areas you saw looked like this. Swamps with rushes, with buffaloes, and the people who lived there were the people we saw in the first, uh, in first pictures. And they were Bedouins who lived in swamps. Now, after uh, uh, 1922, something like that, um, the area was um, bought by Baron Rothschild um, who was a who was a very uh, he, he was a very rich Jew in uh, in France, and he helped the settlers of Palestine of uh, Israel. It was not not Israel yet, but many people he gave money, and many people started to um, drain the swamp. You see them working. Uh, look uh, how they work. They work manual um, uh, labor because there were no, no tractors yet. And then only a small uh, part of the swamp 
stayed till now. They drained everything, and only a small uh, part which had the deepest springs that um, were that, uh, that still giving water out of the uh, strata down. And then, when you walk to the beach, what do you see on the way? Fish, fish ponds. Hmm? Fish ponds, right? There were no fish ponds at the beginning when we came here. It looked like this, dunes from here to the Mediterranean, to the coast, dunes. But in the dunes, the water, we saw that in the winter when there were rains, the water stayed. So we understood that down under the dunes, there is a, a, a region that does not let the water seep, uh, and it, it keeps the water. And that's why we decided to make the fish pond there. This is a group which in 1949 came to settle Magan Michael. There was nothing. There were the, the, there were the dunes and there were nothing, that, uh, the, no houses, nothing. <clears throat> the people who lived there, you saw the pictures, right? The woman with the child and uh, uh, you, the Bedouins, you saw them. Now, they had to leave. The, uh, <coughs> they had to leave the area because uh, otherwise the swamps couldn't be drained. So the Baron Rothschild, he bought land from, Ar from very wealthy Arabs and the, on the land they settled which is now, you know the Jesser Azarka? You know the Arab village? Thank you. You have been there? Yes. So, there are the people the, whose uh, parents and grandparents were the Bedouins who lived in the swamp. Now, they live in the, in the village uh, adjoining Magan Michael. You can tell and us. this is the group of, um, of our uh, first settlers and uh, we were young people who just finished school and it was the time of World War II and we wanted to do something, something that could help to, to bring about a Jewish state, because you know about the Holocaust, right? Yes. And we, we knew what happened in Europe, and we wanted to do something. So we decided, we were finishing school, and we decided we will join together in a group, and we will settle somewhere and build a kibbutz. That's how it started. So these are the initial people of the uh, kibbutz. We di uh, did not, it was not the, um, uh, uh, the, it was not the first place we, uh, we came to. Before that, we were, <coughs> we worked in a factory that was, um, that was secret. Uh, I'm talking about the 40th uh, of uh, last century. Here in Palestine, there was the British rule. Like in India, and like in Nepal, <coughs> and I think, I don't know in the Philippines, was there a British rule? No, American rule, right. But like the American rule in the Philippines, the British rule in uh, India, and here in so-called Palestine. And we knew 
that the British would leave, and when they would leave, uh, we will have problems with the Arab population here. So we had to prepare for a war. And when the British actually left, then <coughs> there was the war of independence of, of the Jewish state, yes? The Jewish state started, and um, secretly we worked, uh, we were asked to work in a, a factory that makes bullets. Bullets for, you know, for uh, arms. So we worked there, and that was uh, before, the, before the state was uh, acclaimed. And in 1949, when there was a Jewish state already, we could leave the, the factory and go to and go to settle our place, Maagan Michael. Now, how does it look? Here you see the big celebration. People come in and look at the small houses. They're still there. When you walk from here to the you know the small, uh, uh, near the uh, Beit Saudi, you see small wooden houses, right? They're still there. Okay, the 64 dentist. years, they're still there. And, uh, and other wooden houses that were, were we lived at the beginning until we <coughs> built the houses. And I don't know if you see, do you see um, trees? Something like trees. You see them? Mm -hmm. So those are the same trees, the big <coughs> ficus trees, which we also see on our way to the Chadarofen. And that's how they began. And that, that was the beginning. And as I said, we had the dunes, and we saw that the water stayed in the dunes. So we decided we couldn't make uh, fields of that, of the dunes, but we could make fish ponds. So here you see the first tractors pushing away the dunes and then putting in water from a stream that is near here. It is called the crocodile stream. And there were crocodiles, but not. But we didn't see any. But there were crocodiles in history. We saw, we read many things of people who went there along the coast, and they saw in the stream crocodiles. And even at the end of the stream, there was a Roman city called Crocodilopolis, the, the meaning the um, uh, town of the crocodiles. But of the, la the crocodiles now are extinct, and, uh, but you, you can visit the stream. Maybe there is a nature reserve there, and it is a very nice uh, tiul. You even can go with, uh, with your child, I think. אפשר שם להגיע נחמד, עד הנחל, עם העגלות, עם הכל, וכדאי בהחלט. אוקיי, so we also had children, of course. You know that children in מעגן מיכאל is a very big issue. There are many children, and these are the first, the first children of מעגן מיכאל. Now they are, all of them, grandparents. Wow. <laughs> All of them have grand grandchildren. Yes, and these are my private Shlomit. children, uh, who are, of course, both of them have grandchildren as well. My, uh, that's my first daughter and my first son. And now, what, uh, what did we, uh, how did we live, uh, what, what did we do? In the fish pond, as you saw, they were open. There was work. Uh, have you seen uh, sometimes when you make a tiul uh, in the fish ponds? Have you seen people working there? Yes. 
They work in the water, and they like working there. The young people like very much to work at the fish ponds. But it's not enough uh, to grow fish, um, edible fish. We started with edible, edible fish, carp, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, some potatoes uh, fish, if you know. But um, we also wanted uh, we wanted to expand. We wanted to do something else, and we started to grow koi fish. You know, it's a Japanese. Uh, or it's ornamental, ornamental fish, and um, uh, we can grow it by uh, our uh, members study it at the university. They study genetics and uh, fish growing, and uh, we grow these fish and we export them. They go by uh, airplane. They in in big. Um, First nylon, and then much air is pumped into it, and then it's put in a, in big crates, and at night it goes to Ben Gurion, and it goes all over the world. I think we export to uh, to England and to uh, America, even to America, and. Uh, of course, I think that we don't export them to the to it into your countries because there are they grow the the koi uh, from Japan. It, uh, the Japanese is easier to bring them from Israel. Yes, um, work alone, work in fish ponds and in the field is not enough. So 1962, we decided to build a factory. You know Plasson. I'm, I'm sure you know Plasson. And if you don't, I think you should visit it. Plasson. Uh, Plasson is a factory of plastic. <coughs> and it is also very successful. And also we export to many, many countries. And uh, that's how we, uh, we can make our living not only from the land, but also from, from our heads, yes? From what we know. Uh, how, how, how do you say in English? The know-how, right? <laughs> the the know-how. We know how to do things. So this is Plasson. And I was talking about fish ponds, right? So in fish ponds, we grow fish for eating, for ornamental, but to, we also have somebody competing with us in the fish ponds. And those are the birds. Now, for I think thousands of years, this place, Israel and also the coast, was a meeting place for migrating birds. Birds that come from Europe in, um, and now in, in the autumn, they come, they come in September, October, and they come here and go to Africa. And that's where they stay as long as in Europe there is snow. So I'll show you some birds um, which we, uh, they, they come here, and of course there is a dilemma. Do we let them stay or don't we let them stay? All the bird watchers from all over the world come and want to see birds in Madame Michael. And we say, ah, but we want to fish. The birds are competing <laughs> with us. <laughs> what do we do? Well, as usual, there is a compromise. Uh, we, uh, <clears throat> there is also also something I am talking about the, uh, the uh, birds because I myself am a bird watcher. So you must understand I am also a member of Madame Michael, but I am a bird watcher. And I'll tell you something. First of all, the birds are not all the time. And then the birds are not eating 
only fish. Birds are also eating all kinds of small animals in the water. And then they don't do any harm. No, no harm. And if they come, they, are, they don't stay here. They stay here for two, three months, and then they go on. Now, I've selected a few pictures, uh, which Raymond has taken, <laughs> and, um, and uh, of, uh, of birds that are only migrating here. They are only passing through here. So let us see. This one is called, in English, coots. It is actually a small, how do you say, uh, it's like a hen. But it lives in the water, and you can recognize it by the white beak. And then there is somebody else. This one eats fish. <laughs> I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't brought um, a, a, the pictures. I have some pictures where we see it with a big carp in its beak. But, uh, but, look at, uh, but look at the beak. It has a big beak, and it's a heron. Maybe there are herons in India as well, or in your part of the world. Uh, but they are different. I mean, they, they don't migrate. This one is uh, called the big uh, gray heron and it migrates. That means that if you see it now, in a few weeks, it will be gone. It will go back to Europe, to Finland, Sweden, Denmark, and there it will nest. And there's an other set. Look how you, you see the beak, right? Now this one doesn't eat fish, but it eats small fries, small um, insects in the water, and then it, how, how does it uh, uh, capture them? It, with the beak, it makes like this. So every time it comes into the water, it has something to eat. That's an avocet. Um, ah, here is somebody called a kingfisher. This one stays the whole year round. You can see it in winter, you can see it in summer, you can see it on the kibbutz. It's not only in the fish ponds, because it eats not only fish, but also other insects, small lizards, small, uh, uh, small birds. It, you see it has a very strong beak, right? The red. And this one is called the Smyrna. Uh, a kingfisher. Uh, why Smyrna? Because Smyrna is a town in uh, in Turkey, Turkey, and um, that's uh, the, 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 uh, until, uh, he, it is uh, spread out until Turkey over Turkey and over the whole uh, whole area, and we have it, uh, and also in, in Africa, but mostly in the area of uh, Turkey, and uh, the, the Levant, uh, Israel as well. Here. Yeah. And there is another kind of, uh, well, I'm sorry, but uh, fish eating <laughs> a bird, and that is, uh, that is an egret. It's, it's uh, uh, from the same family, like the big gray heron we saw. And you see that they, they were in winter, they congregate here in big groups. Birds, many birds, like to flock together. Nobody knows exactly why. And there is, a, we think that it is in order to pass information. When a, a big, uh, when a big group comes together, then maybe one says, "Look, there is a fish pond, and there are fish. Maybe there are people who are driving uh, birds away, 
Anyhow, they change information, and that's why they are mostly in big groups. Not all the birds. They are birds that are solitary, that like to be for themselves. This one is a seagull. You must know it. It in all oh, it is in all places where the sea near the sea you see gulls, all kinds of gulls. This special kind of gull is um, from Europe. And I don't know if you see, do you see that it has a black spot near its eye? Do you see it? Mm -hmm. You see the black spot? In winter, when they come to us, when they migrate, this is how they look. In spring, which starts actually now, today, tomorrow, they, this small black dot expands on the whole head and it gets a black head. And that's how the people in Europe know it. Oh, they know it only because they know it in, in summer, in spring, in spring, when they leave us. And that's how they know it. They know it only with black head. And uh, here we know it only with a small dot. Um, ah, no, the, this is the mo most important uh, bird. You know why? Or maybe in your countries it doesn't, but in, in Europe, the stork brings the babies. And it is like this. In Germany, and in France, and in Turkey, and in Italy, and in Spain, they nest on houses, on chimneys, or on, uh, on, on a high roof, they nest in summer. So probably if children uh, who live there asked uh, when a small brother or daughter was, uh, um, was born, they asked them, where do the children come, where do they come from? And then the mother says, oh, I don't want to start telling them how children are made, uh, the stork brings them. Maybe that's how the mythos, the myth started. Anyhow, the uh, storks migrate from Europe in autumn. They come to us in winter, and we see them in the fish ponds. And they don't eat obligatory um, fish, they eat also uh, water snakes and lizards and what, whatever, small cr uh, crabs, whatever there is in the water. Uh, perhaps also, uh, uh, okay, uh, small animals, not only fish. Okay. This is a big congregation of the, of the seagulls, as I told you, uh, um, water birds like to congregate together. As I said, perhaps perhaps they share information. It, there are people who say that it's not information. It's um, like um, they help each other, or they um, again protect. Hmm? Protect. They protect each other. But I think that the theory of uh, information is the right one. Okay. Here is another, um, another picture of the stream, of the, as I said, the, the stream that we take the water. It's a, a little brackish water, meaning uh, salty water. Not like the sea, but it's... It's salty water, so it cannot be used for other things, but we can give it to the fish. Fish don't care. Fish can, <coughs> can live on uh, salty water as well. So this is the Crocodile River, and uh, in 
ancient times, in Roman times, the Romans built a dam on the river. They wanted the water to rise and they took the, the water in um, aqueduct to a place called Caesarea. Do you know Caesarea? It's not far from here. It was in Roman times a very big city. And that's when they, they took the water from the crocodile stream as well and from other places and the dam is still there and now it is a nature reserve for all those people I was telling you about that they came to see the birds they also want to see antiquities and they want to see the, the, the whole environment and so they come to the nature reserve on the Taninim stream okay. Oh, that's the water and you see the people staying up there and looking at the looking at the water you know it may be uh, maybe you, you cannot understand it but we are a very thirsty land we don't we don't have much water you maybe most of you are used to big streams, to lakes, to springs. But we, when we have a small river, that's very important for us. If we have a, free, a few springs, that's important. So you see, whenever there is water, we come to see. Here you see the people coming. Uh, perhaps they were uh, looking at, uh, at the fish pond and you see a uh, few houses. And that's a field school. It is on the, maybe you have seen there, you have been there. It's also a nice uh, hike. And um, there are people, uh, there, uh, it's uh, f built by the um, Society for the Protection of Nature in Israel. And uh, it's built on Madame Michael land, but it doesn't belong to us. Only some people of us worked there or uh, went there on hikes and so on. So this, uh, the, uh, the picture is of the field school and of people looking down at the river. Okay. That is the Arab village of Jitzaradarka, which I told you before, um, for the inhabitants of the swamp, it was built by the inhabitants of the swamp. Uh, of course, not uh, not they, but uh, their parents and grandparents. And it is a very big. Um, uh, it's a very big village. It's nearly a small town, and maybe. <laughs> Maybe you could go there. Um, it, it's uh, starting, they are starting some kind of tourism. They uh, have a hospice, you can, uh, uh, you, you can stay there and you can walk in the, in the village. It is uh, quite interesting. Okay. This I don't have to explain. <laughs> this is where you come in. So I hope that uh, that uh, these pictures have shown showed you shown you a um, different uh, a different uh, face of Magan Michael than you know every day. And thank you. <laughs>